Good morning. We have to deal with that today with a very complex group of nuclei at the base of the brain that derive from the diencephalon and that uh, is the most is the largest of the structures within the diencephalon that contains the so-called dorsal thalamus that I'm referring to today as the thalamus in addition to the hypothalamus that we discussed already we uh, and also the subthalamus that deals with the basal ganglia system and the epithalamus that is part of the limbic system. So today we are going just to restrict ourselves to the thalamus or dorsal thalamus or thalamus, thalamus proper. The question is why the thalamus relatively late in our teaching and uh, you have been exposed to thalamus in various sensory systems and even in the motor system as networks that are processing information that eventually will reach the cerebral cortex. And uh, indeed, the thalamus has been considered like the antechamber, that's what thalamus means, the antechamber to the cortex. And uh, we are at that stage, at this point, that we are going to go into the study of the cerebral cortex and therefore the thalamus uh, is, is the moment to put together what you know already about the thalamus and some additional information that will show up uh, now. So you have to understand from this material the role of the thalamus in the in processing of information be, before is this information reaches the cerebral cortex and also and also uh, the types of information that that the thalamus deals with and the organization of the nuclear groups and their connections and finally the modes of operation of thalamic neurons according to levels of consciousness. Uh, we have discussed part of this um, material when we dealt with the visual system at the level of the lateral geniculate nucleus now we are going to go back to that and give more details of its functioning. Now, let's put the thalamus in context. First of all, you have, let's say, that's the thalamus, let's say. And then you have the brain with the cerebral cortex uh, as the most superficial layer of the brain. Now, the thalamus receives several kinds of information. For instance, it receives information from the sensory systems. It receives information from the motor system. Remember, the, most particular the, the motor control systems like the cerebellum and basal ganglia. It receives information from the limbic system quite a bit, as you may recall. It receives also information for the, for the so-called reticular formation, which is this matrix of the tegmentum of the, ba of the brainstem that remains after carving out all the pathways and all the cranial nerve nuclei and all the large nuclei and all the monominergic and cholinergic groups and so forth and so on. It projects also to the thalamus, this reticular formation. Then you have also that the thalamus, in turn, after processing that information, all right, there will be an output of the thalamic networks that is going to convey the information to the cerebral cortex. When this happens, the cerebral cortex itself will send back information to modulate the thalamic function. So, so far, we are dealing with uh, very topologically arranged systems, all right? Uh, from certain parts of the visual fields or certain parts of the, uh, of the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus and from certain parts of the somatosensory field it will reach either VPM or VPL if it's the face or it's the body and so forth and so on. So in a very topologic fashion, the same for the motor system. All right? But then there are two more systems that you have to consider that are providing modulatory controls through diffusely arranged uh, organizations. One is the cholinergic system that 
takes origin, let's say, in the midbrain, as we're going to see eventually, all right? And not only innervates the thalamus, but also projects directly to the cerebral cortex. And then you have all the monoaminergic systems, neodopamine and epinephrine and serotonin, that again provide innervation to the thalamus for particular function and projects diffusely to the cortex also. So you have here uh, an important uh, point to uh, keep in mind because you'll, you'll hear that nothing comes into the cortex that doesn't go previously to the thalamus. That's correct for the topological arrangement of functions, but there are these diffuse systems that are going to reach the cortex without going through the thalamus. All right, with these concepts in mind, let's uh, discuss the various nuclear groups of the thalamus. First of all, let's say this is a view of the thalamus, a cartoon view of the thalamus uh, from the top. Right? You're looking at it head on, right? And here you have the coordinate for this. This is rostral and this is caudal and this is medial and this is lateral. It's all right. Then you have a key here for the functions of various nuclei. You see that in blue will be motor or sensory nuclei. In red will be limbic. In yellow will be intrinsic within the thalamus itself. In green will have nuclei that have widespread cortical activations carried on. And finally, in white, you will have a special nucleus uh, that has no cortical projection. Or that means that a nucleus, a, a nucleus that fails the rule that the thalamus always projects to cortex and receives a cortical projection in turn. This nucleus does not project to the cortex. All right, let's take a look how it's arranged. This is the rostral pole. The rostral pole, right, of the thalamus is an, a nuclear group that is called the anterior group that is of limbic nature. This is the, uh, the anterior group, remember, is, is a nucleus of the thalamus, this you know already, that, uh, that receives the mammalothalamic bundle. It's part of Pape circuit, right? And projects to the cingulate gyrus. Now, then the rest of the thalamus is like divided by a lamina of, of white matter that separates these bundle, these nucleus from these ones, all right? Medial and lateral. This bundle of this lamina of malinated fibers contains neurons within, right? And these are what is called the intralaminar nuclei that are located within the medullary lamina. Now, medial to that, you have a large nucleus here that is called the medial dorsal nucleus of the thalamus, that, as I put it here, is mostly of limbic nature. And then you have this very big mass here, the lateral mass, that contains various nuclei here, as you can see, from rostral to caudal, you have the lateral dorsal, the lateral posterior, and the pulvinar, which is the, like the caudal pole of the thalamus, that's called the pulvinar. Still remains all this area, right? And this area are, right, are actually ventral nuclei, that you, know, you, are, you are looking at the thalamus head on. So under all this mass are the ventral nuclei. And the ventral nuclei are very large and like overflow the lateral margin and show up in this kind of projection. And the ventral nuclei are these, the VA, VL, uh, VA and VL are motor, and then VPL, VPM, that is not in here because of the projection, and the geniculate nuclei, both lateral and medial, are of sensory nature. Finally, you have that lining uh, the medial wall of the thalamus. And remember that medial wall of the thalamus is really the wall of the third ventricle, right? So under the ependyma, right there, there is a group of nuclei that, is, that are called the midline nuclei. And finally, you have covering, like enveloping the rest of the thalamus. The, within the brain substance, right? Not in the midline, because in the midline you have the cavity of the third ventricle, but the rest is, makes a mass with the brain, all right? You have this lamina of, of neurons, all right? 
this lamina of neurons that envelops the entire thalamus, and that this is what is called the thalamic reticular nucleus. Now, uh, last word on nomenclature. You see, there are groups of nuclei, like the anterior nuclei or the ventral nuclei, right? And the label, how do you call these nuclei, is usually with two words. The first word refers to the group, and the second word is the nucleus within the group. So, for instance, if you have here, uh, the let's say, the VA nucleus is the ventral, is the anterior nucleus of the ventral group, the lateral nucleus of the ventral group also, and so forth and so on. And it's important because you can see in the literature, whatever, sometimes this is a very important nucleus, particularly for limbic functions, all right, that is called the medial dorsal nucleus because the group is the medial group and is the dorsal nucleus of the medial group, which is different than when um, you know, the nucleus, um, let's say in the anterior group, there are several nuclei that I'm not mentioning. There is one that is the, um, let's say, the ventral nucleus of the anterior group. That would be AV, which is very different than VA. So you have to have clear that you have to always designate the nucleus with the first word referring to the group, and the second word is the nucleus within the group. And never call this nucleus the dorsomedial. Is the medial dorsal nucleus. All right. Now, in terms of uh, function and connectivity, this is a, an involved table, right? Um, it's difficult to put in any other way. I imagine that there are better ways. And you have a table in which you 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 have you have here the function, and then the corresponding nucleus for that function, and then you get uh, the input to that nucleus and the output of that nucleus, right? So you have here a group of sensory nuclei. You know them very well because you have gone through all the sensory systems already, right? So you have, got, you have VPL and VPM and the lateral genicular and the medial genicular, that typical sensory nuclei, right? This for somesthesis, uh, this will be below the neck, this will be above the neck, this is for vision, and this is for hearing. All right, these are sensory nuclei. And you know the afferents, you, you know the afferents for each one, and I, I, I don't think I have to review that or read it for you. You have to relearn it and remember what you know already, all right? And know that whatever happens in these networks are going to project to the cortex in very discrete portions of the cerebral cortex. For instance, VPL, we project to somatosensory cortex, all right, and also to vestibular cortex, and VPM, is going to project also to somatosensory cortex, but in, in regions that are more ventrally placed. And the lateral geniculate will uh, project to the visual cortex, or V1, and the uh, medial geniculate to the auditory cortex, or A1. All right? So all these are sensory nuclei. Then you have motor nuclei. You have VA and VL. VA receives mostly from the basal ganglia and projects mostly to M2. All right, so you, you went already through the, through the sensory and the motor. Then in limbic nuclei, you know some of them already also. The anterior group receives mammalothalamic and projects to singular cortex. Then the medial dorsal, all right, uh, it receives from the amygdala and it receives to, to uh, portions of the cortex and, um, and projects in turn, particularly to frontal cortex. Right? Now, all of these, what we have just reviewed, uh, which is all this, right? We reviewed up to there. You know already from previous lectures and previous subjects of the course. Now, you have to you know, get, have in mind that the afferents to all nuclei, all the afferents to all nuclei, receive also from the cerebral cortex, from the corresponding region, and also from the diffuse systems, in addition to these topologically organized, precise uh, sources. Then we are adding now a couple of other nuclei. The lateral dorsal, lateral dorsal nucleus, all right? This, uh, this, uh, this uh, is not clear what the afferents are, but it projects definitely to parahippocampal gyrus. You see, uh, the anterior nuclei, here, 
project to the cingulate gyros, and this one project to the parhippocampal gyros, making the whole uh, limbic lobe loop. Then you have um, the what are called the intrinsic nuclei of the of the thalamus, uh, and in here you have uh, the lateral posterior and the pulvinar. These are nuclei that receive input mostly for other nuclei of the thalamus, all right? And project differentially these more to parietal regions and these more to preoccipital regions. Right? Uh, the next group will, re will be a group of nuclei that project very widely to cerebral cortex, uh, like the intralaminal nuclei, and one large, larger intralaminal nuclei is what is called the central median. All right? These nuclei essentially are receiving input from spinothalamic fibers, from the reticular formation, from basal ganglia, all right? and they are in turn projecting to wide areas of the cerebral cortex. And uh, uh, the central medianum even projects back to the basal ganglia. Finally, you have the control of all the distalamic uh, activities, which is carried by the so-called thalamic reticular nucleus. Remember that this is the single nucleus that does not project to the cortex, all right? It, do, it does receive input from cortex and from the underlying... Remember that this, this nucleus just was enveloped in the entire thalamus, so it receives input from the cerebral cortex and from the underlying thalamic nucleus, and in turn projects back to the underlying thalamic nucleus in a specific way that we'll discuss in a moment. All right, let's, uh, let's discuss now uh, synaptic activity according to behavioral states. Uh, in red, I'm putting excitation, and in blue, inhibition. So you have here an arrangement where there are neurons in the thalamus that are so-called projection neurons, right? That the axons of which are projected to the cortex. That's fundamental, right? And you see here that both the output of the thalamus and the cortex that actually projects back to the thalamus, they are both excitatory and utilize glutamate as the major neuroactive substance. All right, that you have already one loop there. Now let's put some sensory information. You know, maybe here at this level between the thalamus, between the projection neurons and the cortex, you have what is called you have here what is called the thalamic reticular nucleus that is between the two. So anything that goes out of the thalamus to the cortex has to go through the thalamic reticular nucleus that is enveloping, right? And when it does that, it leaves collaterals in the thalamic reticular nucleus. Similarly, the reciprocal projection of the cortex on the thalamus has to also go through the thalamic reticular nucleus. There's no other way of going there, all right? And on coming down, it leaves collaterals in the reticular nucleus. Now, uh, take a look that now this reticular nucleus is receiving excitatory input from both the cortex and the underlying thalamic nucleus. What will be the result of it, this information processing and the consequent uh, um, result? It will be a projection from this nucleus to the underlying reticular nucleus in, a, in, a, in an inhibitory function, right? So you have now an important source of inhibition into the thalamic nucleus. In addition, the thalamic nucleus itself not only has these projection neurons, but has, have also small uh, interneurons that are GABAergic, and therefore they are inhibitory, and they in turn contact the projection neurons. So you have here the projection neuron that is excitatory and is reciprocal connection of the cortex excitatory. And then you have two inhibitory influences on that projection neuron, one from the thalamic reticular nucleus, the other from intrinsic uh, interneurons in the geniculate. Let's put now some inputs. And let's start, for instance, with sensory inputs. Sensory inputs like visual or hearing, any, any kind of sensory input, all right? It's excitatory, always. Sensory input is excitatory, as I mentioned in the first panel. And 
it utilizes either an excitatory amino acid like glutamate or also a dipeptide, which is the N-acetyl aspartyl glutamate. And uh, for instance, when the person is awake, this input is going to go into the corresponding thalamic nucleus, sensory thalamic nucleus, and you see that it's going to excite both the projection neuron and the interneuron. But here you have a gadget already, right, in which the, the sensory input excites the projection neuron that in turn will be inhibited by the interneuron. And that most probably the is uh, what uh, is the basis for the phasic activity of this during wakefulness. Uh, it does happen in sleep also, by the way, because you know although you're asleep, still you have sensory inputs. You have vision. You know, you're watching television, and uh, the television keeps on going. You close your eyes and you fall asleep, but the information still is going on through your eyelids. Now you have now another uh, system that is particularly active in wakefulness. And this is a system that is cholinergic. All right? And the cells of origin are mostly in the so-called parabrachial or pedunculopontine nucleus in the tegmentum of the midbrain and pons, just at the limit. All right? It's a cholinergic projection, widely arranged, and that covers the thalamus in such a way that the input now will go both, will go to everything, will go to the interneurons, it will go to the projection neurons, and it will go also to the th th thalamic reticular nucleus. But look here, you know very well that the action of the transmitter, it depends on the receptor that is grabbing it, right? And here, at the level of the projection neuron, it's a very excitatory, very tight synapse that is made of nicotinic receptors. This junction here is nicotinic, whereas this other, and is excitatory, whereas here, the input to the interneurons and the input to the thalamic reticular nucleus is inhibitory, and, and is, um, is, are two forms of muscarinic receptors. So, during wakefulness, this cell group discharges, and the end result is a strong excitation of the projection neurons because not only it excites directly the projection neurons, but also inhibits the inhibitory inputs to the projection neurons from the reticular nucleus and the interneurons. There are other systems that are also very active in wakefulness. For instance, um, uh, noradrenergic projections from the locus ceruleus, and also something that we mentioned in the hypothalamus, the tuberomamillary nucleus output that is histaminergic. The end result is not so well delineated as for the cholinergic input, but the end result is, is increases the excitability of the uh, projection neuron. That occurs in, in wakefulness. Finally, you have a, a system now, that also a diffuse system, that is mostly at the thalamic level, is acting in the sleep uh, uh, cycle. Uh, and this is the serotonin that is produced in the rafe nuclei, in the dorsal rafe nucleus, projects to the thalamus, it projects to many other places, right? And the action of serotonin is also important in certain uh, stages of alertness that involve attentional processes. It's very really complex, but at the thalamic level, the input from the serotoninergic cells affects both the projection neuron and the interneuron in a different fa in a differential fashion. It's going to inhibit or decrease the excitability of the projection neuron, and at the same time, it's going to stimulate, excite, in a, in a some kind of a, a ionotropic serotoninergic receptor here in the interneuron that gets excited. And the end result, of course, if it directly inhibits, yet at the same time excites an inhibitor interneuron, is decreasing majorly the activity of the projection neuron. All right. Now, when you record from thalamic cells, you see that they have two modes of operation. 
and that is different in wakefulness and in sleep. In wakefulness, the neurons of the thalamus fire in a tonic fashion, which means, for instance, if you have here a steady resting poten potential of minus 50 millivolts, all right, and you put the stimulus here, a light, whatever, a stimulus, the neuron will, the, the, the membrane potential of the neuron will be essentially depolarized and giving rise to a spike. And there is a sequence of spikes that is like transmitting very faithfully the information that comes into the thalamus going to the cerebral cortex. And that occurs in wakefulness. Now, in sleep, in drowsiness and in, in deep sleep also, the same neuron fires in a different way to the stimulus. And it fires differently because the resting potential of the thalamic neuron in these stages of awareness, in drowsiness and sleep, is not a steady resting potential. It's an oscillatory potential, right, that varies between minus 60 and minus 70, all right, and, uh, and most probably is a reflection of an intrinsic oscillatory um, behavior of the thalamic reticular nucleus cell that are transmitting that kind of uh, activity to the underlying thalamic nucleus. What happens here now is that if, when you record from the cell, at some point, as you can see, the cell becomes depolarized here, right? So what happens is that there is, when the stimulus comes, there is a slow rising calcium spike, all right, that occurs during the period of hyperpolarization and reaches a peak and then it decreases during the, the depolarization that cuts off somehow this uh, low threshold calcium spike. Now, when this kind of postsynaptic potential occurs, if it reaches a certain level of depolarization, it gives rise to a burst of spikes. So at the crest of each of these low threshold calcium spikes come the actual potential spikes in burst. And that's characteristic of the sleeping stage. Very different than the uh, awake. That means that it gives rise already to the idea that the thalamus not only is processing the information that is coming into it, um, making it sharper or more contrasty or more discreet, any way you want, and transmit that faithfully to cerebral cortex. But during sleep, this kind of activity results actually in a gate of the information that does not reach now the cerebral cortex. And that's essentially what you need when you fall asleep. You don't care about the stimuli, you know, the, the sirens that is on the street, or the television that keeps on going. All that comes into organism, but you, can, you, you, you sleep anyway. And that's because the thalamus is gating that information and does not allow the information to reach the cortex when you are sleeping. All right, what about the effect of lesions in the thalamus? Uh, there is one thing, one, one syndrome that is very characteristic that is called the thalamic syndrome, all right? It occurs in infarcts, you know, hemorrhagic infarcts that destroy the thalamus in great part, not, not, not fully, but in great part, and that gives rise to a syndrome that is a contralateral hemianesthesia, right? Because, let's say, in the somatosensory system, if VPL, VPM are destroyed, the opposite side of the body will have some kind of an anesthesia. Right? But that's not the important thing. The important thing is that this is accompanied by a severe kind of pain that is called the central pain, uh, that is very difficult to treat and is very disturbing to the patient. It's very severe and probably is related to changes in the GABA receptors of the, within the thalamus. It's not very clear, but it's a, it's a tough one. It's a tough syndrome. All right? Then there are other things. For instance, you have uh, diseases in which uh, there is a tremor, you know, an alternate. Well, let's say, let's say in, in Parkinsonism, all right? So you have a rhythmic, a rhythmic activity of the um, 
musculature, right, that gives rise to this tremor that has a certain rhythmicity at a certain frequency. Well, it so happened that the rhythm, the ry rhythmic bursts in the ventral nuclei in Parkinson's disease, you know, VA, VL, all right, these this, uh, nuclei that have to do with motor control from basal ganglion cerebellum, all right, uh, it is of the same frequency that, uh, that of the tremor itself. So it is possible that this tremor is due to a frequency transform in palidothalamic circuits. Then it, the, you can have also amnesia from uh, thalamic lesions, particularly from the anterior nuclei and even more from the medial dorsal nucleus. You know, the famous Corsac of dementia many times shows a bilateral influx of the medial dorsal nuclei. Then you have another thing, you know, as you are going to learn in epilepsy, there is a form of epilepsy that are these petit mal attacks or absence attacks, all right, in which for a few seconds, very briefly, the patient loses consciousness and regains it immediately and doesn't even realize that it happens and that interferes very much with learning in school and so forth and so on. Uh, there is a, a special pattern in the EEG that is, a, that is called the spike and wave pattern that is characteristic of this kind of epilepsy. Well, it happens that this kind of pattern is entrained by very long bursts of GABAergic neurons of the thalamic reticular nucleus. So there is a relationship there between the physiology of this thalamic reticular and the uh, clinical manifestation. How about cognition and awareness? Well, these are cortical functions, right? However, there are cases with persistent vegetative state that are due to bilateral lesions of the thalamus with relatively intact cortex. So thalamus has even a role there too. Another piece of information is schizophrenia, for instance. There is a decrease in the size of the thalamus, particularly at the expense of lateral nuclei, you know, lateral posterior, lateral dorsal, and mediodorsal nuclei. They are reducing size, and that leads to a total, uh, to a, um, a overall reduced of the size of the thalamus in schizophrenic brains. Finally, you have the situation that during surgery, for instance, for any other purpose, uh, the surgeon could have put an electrode in the pulvinar and stimulated the pulvinar with certain parameters, and the patient that is with, uh, under local anesthesia and is talking to the surgeon, the stimulation produces a stop in the language. So apparently lesions of pulvinar may result in so-called subcortical aphasia that is traditionally considered a uh, cortical function. Well, that ends the subject, so let's uh, pick up the few important points. So the, th the thalamus received this topologic information to the cortex is first processed by thalamic networks in this fashion. The ventral group receives information from sensory nuclei, sensory systems, and motor control system, basal ganglia cerebellum. The medial and anterior groups from the limbic system. The lateral group from other intrinsic nuclei of the thalamus and from the limbic system as well. The intralaminar and midline groups receives from, receive from the brainstem reticular formation and project widely to the cortex. The thalamocortical projection are ipsilateral. That's an important point that I think I didn't emphasize before. All the projections from the thalamus to the cortex are ipsilateral. There is no such a thing as a thalamic projection that goes through the corpus callosum to the opposite cortex. That was some mistake that was made. It's not existent. It's always strictly ipsilateral. Now, the thalamic reticular nucleus is unique because it does not project to the cortex and the output of that nucleus is inhibitory. The output of all the other thalamic nucleus is excitatory, as we discussed before. Now, the thalamic neurons 
operate in two ways according to the state of consciousness. There is tonic firing of the neurons in the waking state, and there is burst firing in the drowsiness and sleep state. Finally, one very typical syndrome from thalamic lesion is the so-called thalamic syndrome that is usually due to vascular lesion that results in contralateral hemianesthesia with severe central pain. Well, that was short and sweet, I hope. Thank you very much.